Paul asks this question, from whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lust that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lust. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But, verse 6, but he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Lord, thank you again for your word. Please help me now to be the preacher, to be the teacher. Lord, to be the pastor that you've called me to be. I ask you now, Lord, just to keep me from saying things that I shouldn't. Cause me to say what you want me to say with the right spirit. And please fill me with your spirit and forgive me of my sin. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. and you may be seated. Uh, just for a moment, I want us to consider reading this verse. It's not written this way. Thank the Lord it's not written this way, but I just want to do a bit of a contrast. What if this were, what if the book of James, what if this letter that James has written to the strangers that are scattered, a bunch of... Uh, predominantly probably new converts and most definitely Jews that are scattered throughout the region. What if the verses read something like this, but he does not give more grace? He loves the proud and judges the humble. Rebel against God, give in to the devil, and he will hang around. What if, you, what if it read that way? Thank God it doesn't. But what we need to understand is there is a contrast to this passage of Scripture. This right here is basically grace that surrounds us and the blessings He gives. That's the, the heading in, in my notes. The grace that surrounds us and the blessing He gives us. Verses 6 and 7. That's, this is how it can be. You can resist the devil and he will flee from you. But the contrast is this. He can hang around. If we do not do, if we do not follow the prescription, he will hang around. And so if we're here tonight and it seems like the devil's been hanging around, there's a reason why he's hanging around. And we want to look at why and how we can stop this from happening, okay? So the first thing I want us to notice is what it says, but he giveth more grace, the gift of grace, Grace is a gift. When we look at this, abstract or concrete, literal, figurative, or spiritual, especially, this is basically grace is, and you already know this, but it's worth repeating, grace is the divine influence upon the heart and its reflection in the life. So when we are experiencing the grace of God, here's what we're, what's happening. We are experiencing a divine influence upon our heart and there is a reflection of that divine influence. If there is not a reflection, then there probably is not the influence. No matter what we say, no matter what people may even say or no matter how much we want to twist it around, the reality is, is that if grace 
has been bestowed upon you, if you are experiencing the grace of God, there will be a reflection of it. You get that? What God is shining upon your heart, what God is putting upon your heart, it will reflect in your life. But then I want you to notice this. Here's what it says. But he, talking about the Lord, giveth more grace. So when we're looking at this passage of Scripture, verses 1 through 5, and we've went over these verses on prior Sunday nights. When we go over this, just, just to pull out one verse to kind of, you know, you know, just punch it in the nose. Ye adulterers and adulteresses. Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? See, James makes a very sharp contrast between what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ and what it means to be a friend of the world. He's basically saying there is no coexistence here. You cannot coexist. If you are in this frame of mind that I... Let's just put it this way. I want the world... I want the things of the world, the things that the world has to offer. He likens it unto someone committing adultery. That's harsh, isn't it? That's a very harsh contrast. But see, there's supposed to be an attitude of heart about us. Why? Because we have experienced God's grace in our lives, God's grace upon our hearts. So when we look at this, and we're reading down through here, and it even talks about that the spirit that dwelleth in us, verse 5, lusteth to envy. We can, we can bring the Holy Spirit to a point of, of envy, not envy in, in green with envy, but jealousy. And we studied this the last Sunday night that I taught on this. We studied how that God is a jealous God. And so we can, we can provoke him to jealousy, and you should never do that. We, anybody who loves you, you should not try to provoke them to be jealous because jealousy stems from uh, the, the other party, the other person, not feeling like they have all of your heart. And so when we are provoking God to jealousy, when we're provoking the spirit that is in us, to jealousy, that is bad. But see, verse number 6 says this, but he giveth more, more grace. What does this mean? Well, it means that the wonderful thing about the Lord and the wonderful thing about the grace of the Lord is there's always more. Amen. There's always more. So we can find ourselves, and if we're going to be honest, I mean, maybe, maybe you're one of those people in here who've never had a war going on inside of you. Look at verse number 1. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lust that war in your members? Maybe you don't have a problem. Maybe there's not things that go on in you. Like, like maybe you don't want the things of the world and want the things of God. Maybe that wrestling match isn't a part of your life. And hallelujah if it's not. Hallelujah if it's not. But for the majority of people, the reason this has to be written is because it's the reality of of most Christians even. He goes on to say, You fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not, and ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. This is a very uh, difficult reality for for most believers is that there's a part of us that wants the things of God. There's a part of us that wants the things of the world. If we're going to be honest, that's just how we exist. And it can become very heartbreaking. It is very uh, uh, convicting to read after the book of James and to read James. And he's calling me an adulterer. What do I do with this? Well, hallelujah. God gives more grace. What an amazing God. He gives more grace. Why? Because you need, I need, let's not talk about you, let's talk about me. I need more grace. Now, that's that's an interesting concept within itself is that there could be more grace. But let's consider, 
Acts chapter 4, verse 32. I didn't give my notes to Hannah, so give her a second to bring those up on the screen. Acts chapter 4, verse, verse 32. I apologize, Hannah. I think I emailed them to everybody but you. It says in Acts 4, 32, And the multitude of them that believed. Now, recognize this. Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost has taken place. The power of God is poured out upon His apostles. They preach in tongues and 3,000 souls have been saved. And by the end, by the time we get to chapter 4, there's quite possibly, all, maybe, even, maybe even by this time, 10,000 people saved. Most Bible scholars believe without a doubt by Acts chapter 6, about 10,000 people have been saved. That's massive, isn't it? Yes. That's called revival. That's revival coming to a city. Amen. Well, and the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Well, you know that's the working of the Holy Spirit. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own. That's definitely the Holy Spirit. But they had all things common. Wow. Verse number 33. And look at what it says, though. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And look at what it says. And great grace was upon them all. In the early church, great grace. Great grace. What does this mean? It means exceedingly great. It means high. It means large. It means mighty. And this is a wonderful thing that, that I'd never seen before until studying it again today. Excuse me, the other day, I didn't study this today, I studied this the other day. The word loud, you know what it is? It's loud grace. Now, now let's, 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 let's comprehend this. Have you ever thought in the concept of loud grace? Well, put it into the reality where, where you might live. The, the, the unholy spirits can be very loud. Does anybody ever, do y'all wake up to unholy spirits hounding you throughout the course of a day. Do they not get loud? Well, guess what? Grace is louder. Amen. When, when they, when they uh, let's put it this way. Now, the Holy Spirit speaks in a still small voice, but, but grace can be loud. Grace has a volume to it. When, when Satan, when the world turns up the volume, guess what? Grace turns it up too. Amen. Their unity and extending of grace resulted in them experiencing great grace. So let me say it like this. There is such a thing as great grace, according to Scripture. Consider Romans chapter 5, if you will go with me there. We'll give Miss Hannah a minute or two, or you can turn in your Bibles. I shouldn't have said a minute or two. It's more like 35 seconds. Romans 5, 12. Look at what it says. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is in the figure of him that was to come. The reality is this. Men died from the time that Adam sinned and failed God because of his failure. Men died from Adam to Moses, even though mankind did not have the law of Moses yet. They still died. The curse of sin was still a reality. Understand that? Amen. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, many be dead, much more, look at this, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. So just like Adam sinning, plunged all humanity into sin, Jesus Christ came and has the ability, by putting faith in Him and what He has done, has the ability to put us all into the grace of God. Yes. Amen. Amen. 
And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which received abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Paul is emphasizing this point. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, look at what it says, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. He is basically letting us know this, that men were born into sin and were dying because of sin, but the law then comes so that what? The, the, the intensity, the awareness, the knowledge of sin is amplified. Well, what happens with this amplification? Grace is amplified. It abounds. Grace is what over, for lack of better words, and I wish that maybe I had better words, we are justified by grace. We are justified by faith. When we are born again, it's because we have put our faith in the finished work of one man. We get this, and that man is Jesus Christ. This is abounding grace. Abounding grace. Sin is overpowered by grace. When sin became great, grace became greater. Consider 2 Corinthians 9, 6. But this I say, He which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loveth a cheerful giver. 2 Corinthians 9, 8. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that ye, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. As it is written, he hath dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. What is this saying? This is talking about someone who is actually giving financially. A person that will give financially will experience grace abounding toward them because God will make sure that you will always have enough to give. This is an experience of givers. This is the abounding grace. This is what I like to call grace giving. Some people can't say, well, I can't afford to give. Um, my mother would say, you can't afford not to give. Amen. You will experience this grace in your life. If you want to be saved, you can experience the grace of God. How? Put faith in Jesus Christ. God's grace will abound. You say, you don't understand my sinfulness. You don't understand the abounding grace of God. If you want to experience great grace as a congregation, if you want to experience great grace in your home, if you want to experience great grace in relationships, guess what? Strive for unity. When you are in unity, when you're in one heart, one mind, one accord, guess what will happen? You'll experience great grace. These are things that the Bible teaches about grace. So here's the reality. Even though we, we, well, I got to, I'm not going to say that. Okay. I'm going to thank you, Lord. Okay. But he giveth more grace. There is the reality that God does give more grace. Maybe the case is this. I'm looking at the book of James. The way I've looked at book, the book of James many, 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 many times. I'm just going to be completely honest with you. I hope y'all can handle my honesty. There's been times when I've read the book of James that I wish the book of James didn't say what the book of James says. Right. Amen. The things that he says that I ask 
and I do not receive because I would just consume it. I wish it didn't say that, but it does say that. So I'm asking, I'm asking, I'm not receiving, I'm not receiving because God knows you're just going to blow it. I wish it didn't say that, but it does. Y'all with me? I am called an adulterer here if I'm a friend of the world, if I've got this wrestling match going on. So there's parts of the book of James. Sometimes, oh, wouldn't it, wouldn't it, sometimes, I, and Lord forgive me, there's been, there's been moments, Lord, am I ever going to get to open up the Bible and I'm the one right? Why is it when I open up the Bible, there's this overwhelming sense of condemnation lots of times? I'm just being, trying to be transparent. But the wonderful thing about the book of James is here it's saying, He really will give more grace. The grace that is needed, the grace that is necessary for us to what? For us to overcome whom? The devil. There is enough grace. There'll be more grace. If you're here tonight thinking there's not enough grace, there is. Consider verse 6. The condition to receiving more grace. Verse 6. But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. What is the condition? for more grace. Humility. That's it. More grace, listen, is not extended because of more work. Some people think, I'm struggling, I'm going through a difficult time, I'm failing, I'm getting up and I'm falling, and all these things are going on. And we think to ourselves, well, if I will just do more, more what? And, and I'm not trying to discredit, I'm not even trying to discredit things that I've taught, okay? But there is this notion that if I will read more, if I will pray more, if I will witness more, if I will do more, you know what I end up? I end up tired, yeah. discouraged. You want to know what the truth is? Here's, here's what God wants me to do. Humble myself and experience His grace. Honestly, He is wanting me to receive His hand up. He is wanting me to receive His salvation. God forgive me, but I, I am one of these people who got saved by grace and kept by works. Huh? I'm probably the only one. Saved by grace, but kept by works. You say, well, that sounds kind of silly. Well, let me ask you, how is your relationship with God when you fall? Am I the only one that falls? I don't think so. How's my relationship with God when I fall? Yeah, I fall. And then I think, oh, no, I got, I got to climb back up. I didn't climb out of the pit that I was in to begin with. It was the grace of God. I cried from the pit. And he picked me up out of the pit by his grace. You know what I should do when I fall? I should just cry. Just cry. Just cry out to God. Say, God, help me. I, I need your help. I need your grace. You can even say, Lord, I need more grace. I need more grace. I hope this is resonating with us tonight. But as long as we try to impress God, when we try to improve upon something that we think we inherently have in us, some type of moral fiber that we do not have apart from the grace of God. Does that make sense? Do we realize this? So much of my life, God forgive me, has been based upon a relationship with God, believing that I in some way on my own was pleasing Him. How can a lump of clay make itself into something that pleases the potter? 
It's an impossibility. Right. You know, the best thing for us to do, humble ourselves Amen. and admit we need grace. When do I need grace? I need it right now. I will need it before the night ends. If God lets me live to see tomorrow, I will need grace tomorrow. Y'all, I don't know how y'all are. I need grace even while I'm asleep. Amen. Yes. I kill people in my dreams. Probably ought not do that. <laughs> Is this making sense? Yes. Right. Yeah. May this sink into my heart and mind. This is a very powerful statement. But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud. If you want to let the de devil hang around, stay proud. Yeah. Stay filled with pride. How, how, what's a, you know what a sign of pride is? I hope that, I hope that you'll let this resonate with you. I'm, I'm trying to receive this as well, okay? My wife knows me better than anybody else in this room, so she knows I've got issues, okay? But you want to know what, what reeks of pride? Self-condemnation. When we look at ourselves and say, now grab a hold of this one. We look at ourselves and judge ourselves and say we are horrible creatures. It is implying that we think we could have been more than we are. And that's pride. What does the Apostle Paul say? I am what I am by the grace of God. Yes, right. We are what we are by the grace of God. We need the grace of God. God is not expecting anybody to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. He is expecting everybody to humble themselves and be completely dependent upon His power working in us and through us right. and on us. It's grace, grace, God's grace. Right. It is amazing grace. Yes. Amen. Amen. One of my favorite lines of that song, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Amen. I wouldn't have known that I was a sinner but for the grace of God. I would not have seen my need for God but for the grace of God. I would not have feared God but for the grace of God. But though I feared God, the same grace made me right with God. Amen. Amen. The prescription for the power. Don't, don't reject this. Don't, don't, I'm going to say it one more time. Let it, let it sink in. God resists the proud. Then I want you to notice the prescription for the power. Verse 7. Verse 6 ends, but giveth grace unto the humble. Verse 7 says this, submit yourselves therefore. Do what? Submit yourselves therefore. Why? Why? Because submission to God is how we receive more grace. Submit yourselves therefore to God. If we are going to resist the devil, then we must submit ourselves to God. This is the order that has to be followed. The life of surrender, for lack of better words, the life of submission... Is the, is the life that is the great grace life. It's not easy to, even though when you think about it, it should be. Lord, forgive me. It should be. When you think that God loves you perfectly, and God loves you unconditionally, God is willing to bestow upon you this divine influence that will reflect in your heart grace. God's willing to do that, right? It seems as though we would all want to submit to someone 
like that. We want to submit to someone like that. And, and yet, we struggle. You know what it is, right? It's a trust issue. We have trust issues. And our trust issues, sadly, are based upon those that have failed us and those that we have failed. There are those, listen, that I have not extended grace to. They failed me. I have not forgiven them in the fullness that I could have. I'm trying, working at it, but not necessarily have pulled it off perfectly. Does that make sense? And then there's the reality that there's others that have not forgiven me. They've said that they have, but there's a strain in the relationship. Everybody with me? It's not exactly how it could be, and they're trying to forgive me. But it's not perfect. That's how we interact with one another, which causes us to struggle with full trust, complete trust. We do not trust other human beings. And we do not trust ourselves. Therefore, we struggle with believing or trusting that there could be anybody completely trustworthy. Right? Well, how are we going to get out of this? I got an idea. How about we humble ourselves and admit we have a trust problem and ask God to give us more grace? Does that make sense to y'all? Humble ourselves. Admit it. Lord, I struggle trusting you. Chris, I know. Lord, I don't want to struggle trusting you. Chris, I know. Lord, the only way that I can, the only way I think, the only way I know how, I just, all I know to do is, Lord, is, Lord, I'm going to, I need you to do, to help me trust you. And he goes, I know, so I'm going to give you more grace. He should be angry, right? He should kick me out of the family, but he hasn't. Um, Here's the amazing thing. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 13. It's familiar to us. Hebrews 13, 5, for sake of time. Hebrews 13, 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness. Don't want what other people have. And be content with such things as ye already have. I put in the already, as ye have. For he hath said... Who? The Lord hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. You've heard me say this a lot. But the Lord genuinely knows that He is enough. You, you, don't, you don't have to have what you think you have to have. You don't have to believe that this thing or that thing, or you, you don't have to look at someone else's life and say, oh, if I had their life, if I had... And you may, even, you may even say, if I had their privilege, if I had been raised by who they were raised by, all of these things, all these things can run through our minds. But here's what God knows about Himself. He knows that He's never going to leave you. He's never going to forsake you. And if you will abide in Him, and if we will trust Him, He genuinely is enough. He's enough. So when we go back to James now, let's go back. He giveth, verse 6, more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. 
Submit yourselves therefore. Why? Because the humble, the submissive person gets the more grace. Submit yourselves therefore to God. This implies that we can know what God desires from us and for us. He wrote it down. One of the things that you can do is you can go to God's Word, receive instructions. Most of us, maybe that's not fair for me to say, some of us, maybe just me, struggle with doing what God says from His Word. You know what, what I've done over the years? I've, I've expected a sign. I've expected some exterior happening. Or even, I've even expected some emotional thing. One thing that I am learning is I cannot even remotely trust my emotions. I'm an emotional creature and I cannot trust them. I'm self-condemning. It's horrible. I cannot trust my emotions. But yet, I keep waiting on something to be just right emotionally so that I can know when really what I need to do is just take a passage of Scripture, read it, and do it. Oh, for example, anybody want to look back a couple of pages and tell me what pure religion is? To take care of the widows and the orphans. Do that. Do that. Uh, there's all kinds of do's and don'ts, right? In Scripture, well, I'm not trying to sound legalistic. I'm just trying to sound sensible. He says... To submit to him. To submit to what? To his instructions. Right. So we do what he says to do, and we don't do what he says don't do. Right. Everybody okay? Yes. Then, then, this is the prescription, right? Then we resist the devil, and he will flee from us. There are certain laws in the universe that God has ordained, and they are in place. And the reality is, is the devil himself knows these laws. And when it comes to uh, the way the universe works, the universe works, and you've heard me teach this before, but the universe works this way. There is supreme authority. That's God. There's no one higher. There's none beside him. He is the one true God. Jehovah Elohim. He's God, right? Yes. Amen. He is the supreme authority. Everything else is delegated. All other authority is delegated by God. And see, these authorities, as we've learned, that that is actually what we're wrestling against. Watch, Watch. Ephesians 6. Principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness, where? In high places. There are these different levels of authority in the satanic kingdom. There's different levels of authority in the kingdom itself. God's supreme, then He delegates authority. Here's what Satan knows. Satan knows is you do not have the right to tell him to get out if you're not submitted to God's authority. He don't have to flee. You don't have the authority. How do we know this? We go all the way back to the garden. We go all the way back to the garden. What happened? Adam and Eve in the garden. Satan comes. I got a picture of a snake peeking over our fence at the house. There's a snake with its head peering over the fence, looking into our backyard. And I thought, man, that, I wonder if that's what the devil was doing that day, looking over the fence into the garden and whispering to Eve. I, maybe I ought to kill that snake before it starts talking to Krista. Amen. But that, 
He comes and what does he do? He causes Eve to doubt God. God's heart towards Eve, God's thoughts towards Eve, and God's words toward Adam and Eve. He causes her to doubt. Well, what happens then? Well, God, they fall, right? They fail. God comes, as you know the story, He cries out to Adam. Where does He go to first? He goes to the one that was created first. The one, Adam. Then Adam blames Eve. And so God says, okay, Adam, you then yielded authority to Eve. You gave her the authority. So then he turns to Eve. What does Eve do? She blames the devil. Oh, okay. So you, Eve, gave authority to the devil. Goes to the devil, and the devil takes the blame. Why? Because it gave him authority. So he takes the blame. So when we are in these wrestling matches, as Ephesians calls it, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but it doesn't say that we don't wrestle. It says that we do wrestle, but we wrestle against. What are we wrestling against? We're wrestling against powers. Right here it says, resist the devil. We are genuinely wrestling against devils, demons, powers, right? We want to resist them. We want them to flee. Well, you have to first humble yourself and submit to God's authority. Well, I've got this devil on me and I just can't get him gone. Well, let check. Are you humble? Are you surrendering to what God is telling you to do. If not, then the devil knows, hey, I don't have to go anywhere. You can resist me. You can renounce me. You can speak what you want to speak. You can say what you want to say. I'm just going to go over here in the corner and wait until you're tired and, and, and quit your talking. And then I'm going to be right back. Yeah. Everybody Okay. Jesus is the example of this in Luke chapter 4, right? What does he encounter? He encounters Satan in the wilderness, right? After fasting, what does Jesus do? Well, Jesus could resist the devil. Some would say, well, Jesus could resist the devil because he's God the Son. And I have no argument against that. But he gives, he, here's what he did. He followed the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. He was submissive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Right. While there... Encountering Satan, what does he do? He attacks back with the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Right? The reason that Jesus could resist the devil as a man in a human body is because he was submissive to the will of the Father. And guess what? Satan fled. Right? When we look at this, the example of the Apostle Paul. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we won't read it because we're running out of time. But you know what it is. It's about the thorn in his flesh. It is a messenger of Satan. As Paul describes it, it is a messenger of Satan that buffets him. And why does he receive this messenger of Satan according to uh, 2 Corinthians 12? It's because if he did not have this messenger of Satan buffeting him, he would get filled with pride and would be exalted above where he should be exalted because of the things that he has seen and heard in the spiritual world. Paul saw things that you and I haven't. He heard things that you and I haven't. And that would elevate him within himself Paul is acknowledging there's a bit of a pride problem maybe. And so here's what he's doing. This messenger of Satan that buffets him has been given to him, has been allowed into his, in his life. And he goes on and how, what, what does the Lord say? He sought to be delivered three times. What does the Lord say to him? My what is sufficient for thee? Grace. My grace is sufficient. See, 
the Apostle Paul went through what he went through so that he would be constantly knowing that he needed more grace. He needed more grace. He goes on to say, Therefore, 2 Corinthians 12, 10, Therefore, because of this, because I can glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me, verse 9. Verse 10, therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The Apostle Paul had come to this place to where when all of these things happened, the list of things happened, and it caused him to break down and need God's grace. He saw that as, oh wow, I experience the grace of God more because of all of these things. Wow. Wow. Paul was able to live in victory even with a thorn of the flesh, a messenger of Satan. He experienced the sufficiency of God's grace because he submitted to the will of God in this matter. I, I, I think it's interesting that the Scripture says, I sought God three times. It means that there came a time in Paul's life when he said, I'm just going to accept that God's grace is sufficient. There wasn't a fourth plea. Right. It isn't Paul's story that I pled a fourth time, a fifth time, a sixth time, a seventh time, an eighth time. No. After the third time, the Apostle Paul says, you know what? I'm just going to accept the grace of God being sufficient Amen. for this infirmity. Good. Have any of y'all seen the movie Sight? It's playing at the cinemas now. It's about a Chinese doctor, and it tells the story of his life and how he became this incredible doctor on, on, on the eyes. It's, in, it's an incredible story. It's a true story, incredible story. And a part of the story is this. I'm gonna, if you haven't seen it, I'm going to spoil it for you, okay? You still ought to go see it because it'll, it'll bless your heart. This Chinese doctor receives this patient. He's been noted as the miracle worker. He's been taunted as that. So a lady from Calcutta, Calcutta, <laughs> Calcutta, India, brings to him a little orphan Indian girl and says, she's blind, but we've been told that you're the miracle worker. Please do something for her eyes. Now, the reason that she's blind is because in India, this took place back in the early uh, 70s or 80s. Not that long ago, actually. Late 70s, early 80s. The Indian people would literally pour, this little girl's story was is that her mother poured acid into her eyes because she would get more money begging if she were blind. True story. The doctor does the surgery on the young girl's eyes. He discovers this miraculous thing about uh, how to take um, the, the fluid around the em embryonic fluid. Is that, am I saying that right? He takes that and is able to douse lenses in that fluid and it causes the eyes to receive the lens around the human eyeball, and he was able to restore the sight of all these different rabbit trials and tests that he did. And he does this on the little Indian girl, and she still is unable to see. But he does the same operation on another little girl, and guess what? It works for her. And to, to date, 
to my knowledge, there have been literally thousands of these operations performed now and people are able to receive their sight because of it. But for this little Indian girl, it didn't work. And see, the whole movie, you think it's about him restoring people's sight and it ends with the actual doctor standing and giving his testimony at the end of the movie. And he says really what happened was because he goes and visits the little Indian girl and the little Indian girl is sitting at the altar of this church and she's blind and she's got these other children around her with disabilities and she's praying for them. And they are getting strengthened by her. And he ends the movie by it wasn't about him giving sight. It was about him receiving sight from the spirit and the attitude of this little girl who he could not be the miracle worker. And he talks about, you can tell in his testimony, he references the grace of God and so on. So you can tell in his testimony that somewhere in the mix he trusted Christ as a Savior. Not because... God healed her eyes, but because He didn't. And because of the grace, listen very carefully, the grace that became more grace for that little girl spilled over. And this doctor saw that he needed that grace. You ought to go see the movie. Lord... Forgive me, it's, it's one thing to preach this, it's another thing, Lord, to live it. I'm thankful for your grace. I'm grateful. Lord, I pray for more grace. I pray that there would be your divine influence upon my heart and that it would be reflected in my life. And I ask this not only for me, but for all those that are here tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.